Hello and welcome to week 14 where we are talking about election content. Primarily we're talking about results and the policies and procedures that lead to certain types of results. The first of which I think is probably our biggest focus this week, which is the Electoral College. Now I'm going to put up another video that animates how the Electoral College works, because that's much more interesting than listening to me talk about it. A couple of things I want to add to that video, though. So you could pause this here and go watch it. You could watch it later, however you choose. The process of selecting or electing electors to elect the president um, can be found in Article 2, Section 1, and it can be described, it's described here. So when we did the scavenger hunt for the Constitution in class, some of you pointed this out. It generally works like this. You have three electors, at least from every state, but it's the number of senators you have, every state has two, plus the number of representatives you have, which at least is uh, one. And that means the least populated states have three, but the most populated states go up based on population. The electors are selected, like who actually gets to be an elector, selected by the political parties themselves, and people um, become electors for that candidate through the political parties. And then the states determine the process by which electors are chosen by the voters. Not every state has to be winner takes all, but all except two states are. Um, people often say maybe we should switch to popular vote. Um, and there are arguments for this. One of your readings this week talks about that, and I highly encourage you to read through that and think about how difficult it would be to change it. But the thing is, is that the Electoral College contains, um, or creates rather, swing states and safe states, which means that some states get more attention than others in the nominating process, but they also get more attention in the policy process as well. The campaigns use this, and it does dilute or exaggerate certain people's votes based on where you live. So the Electoral College is only as good as its results are in many um, instances. Everybody kind of has to buy into at least the process. And twice in the past um, 20 years, the Electoral College has quote unquote failed because it has failed to align with whoever received the largest number of votes in the popular vote. The first time um, in the past 20 years was Al Gore in 2000, um, who did not become President Al Gore. Instead, we had George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton in 2016, who, again, as we know, did not become president. So if the Electoral College fails this often, is it a good system? Or is that not really a failure? The Electoral College has been defended on a lot of grounds, even by the founders who were really suspicious of democracy and kept it in place as a way to distance the, the kind of faction building activity away from the selection of the president. That said, whether those things still ring true or not is another question, and obviously everybody has a different opinion on it. A couple of things we've talked about before with respect to congressional elections. One is the idea of reapportionment and redistricting. Reapportionment being the act of redistributing votes based on uh, redistributing districts within a state, how many um, representatives you get per state, based on popular uh, number. And I am going to pull this down here, in fact. This is my census form because that's done based off of the census, which we are in a census year now. I went online and filled it out. Um, so you can see here, it gives you a code, you fill it out. It's all done online now. There used to be longer paper forms you could fill out if you wanted, um, but it's all online now. Reapportionment means um, if there are more people in Michigan than there were last time, um, based on population across the nation, then we might get more representatives. If there are less, we may get fewer. Redistricting is the act of redrawing those lines based on the number of representatives we have. So you may remember us doing the redistricting game in class. And then gerrymandering is the misuse of that redistricting process for partisan or other types of gain. 
Now, another facet of our congressional election system that is important here is the fact that we have what is called single member districts. It's a winner takes all system. It's different from most other countries in that there's no proportional representation at all in our national legislature. Proportional representation would mean if a party won 51% of the popular vote across the country, pure proportional representation means they would have 51% of the number of delegates to that body. We don't have that. We have people winning from each district, which means, and this has happened quite frequently uh, in the past couple of decades, the one party might win 60% or more of the total votes in across the nation, but because every district stands alone, they might actually have a minority in the House of Representatives. And built into this idea of um, how elections work and what elections are more important, quote unquote, than others is the uh, concept of election cycles. There are different cycles that work based on the federal uh positions that are involved. So presidents have a four-year term, which means every four years we have to have a presidential election. Um, there is something called the coattails effect, which is when a president comes into office, they quite often have a lot of support behind them. And so they bring members of their party into office with them through um, what's called the coattails effect. In other words, members of the House of Representatives or Senate who um, are of that party are kind of brought in on this wave of popularity. So um, when Obama was elected in 2008, for example, the Democrats took back both the House and the Senate at that point in time. That's called the coattails effect. Midterm loss is when two years later, the president's party usually uh, loses seats in the legislative uh, body. So if you look here, there's a chart. 2016 would be when Trump was elected, and I have that bolded and underlined because it had to be a new president that year because the previous one was term limited. Um, we had 33% of the Senate up for grabs. Remember, the Senate is staggered in terms. So they all have six-year terms, but they don't all expire at the same time. And then 100% of the House is up for grabs every two years because their terms are only two years. In 2018, we don't have a president on the ballot. However, these elections are often looked at as a referendum on the president. If you don't like what the president's doing, the president's party is probably going to lose. And that, in fact, did happen really, really significantly in the House, uh, not as much in the Senate for President Trump in 2018. Now, in 2020, we have uh, another presidential election cycle. Congressional election cycles vary, six and two-year terms, but this 2018 and 2022 elections, we talked about last week how midterm elections have decreased voter turnout from presidential elections. So that means that the people who are coming out to vote in 2018 and 2022 are probably more partisan more leaning towards one party that or, or another than the people who turn out every four years for the presidential election. A couple of other things come into play here. Incumbency advantage is one of them. Incumbents, people who already hold the office, are really hard to beat. And often um, they might not even be challenged seriously because they've just held the office for so long or are seen as somewhat unbeatable. Um, so that makes open seats that much more interesting. When someone is resigning, retiring, um, or has died, the seat is, is what we call open, meaning no one who currently sits in that seat is running for re-election. Parties will often throw better candidates out there for those open seats than they will seats where there is an incumbent. So elections for open seats are much more interesting. Um, there's a lot more money spent on them and a lot more interest paid to them. So for a moment, uh, I want to talk about demographics because we talked last time um, about how demographics matter in turnout. Well, I want to show you between 2008 and 2012 how demographics matter in what actually happens in an election. This is um, unlike 2016, which is a little 
a little wonky, although follow similar patterns. Um, pretty typical of how people in general vote. Women tend to vote more Democratic than men do. Um, people of color tend to vote more Democratic than white people who tend to vote more conservatively or Republican. Um, and people as they age tend to be more conservative or Republican in this case than liberal, right? So demographics matter. That doesn't mean everybody within those demographic groups votes the same. What it does mean, though, is that there are some trends we can follow. Now, this brings us to the question of polling um, and probability modeling, because what a lot of people will say about 2016 is, oh, the polls had it wrong. Actually, the polls weren't that far off, and let me explain why. The polls that you probably saw were national polls, meaning you saw quite a few times that Hillary Clinton had a higher percentage of people that wanted to vote for her than Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. That was true. In a national poll sense, she actually won. But the Electoral College is important here, and state-by-state -state polls matter. So understanding how this works, you can come up with a probability model. I won't explain all the math here. A lot of it is, is over my head as well, although I, I can understand the concept. Um, but that feeds statewide polls into a, an algorithm that creates a percentage, which means you can come up with a chance of winning, right? And at the end, Hillary Clinton's chance of winning on 538.com was 71.4%. Donald Trump's chance of winning was 28.6%. That means seven times out of ten, if you run the same election, Hillary Clinton would win, but three times out of ten or so, Donald Trump would win. Now, you can look at other facets, but I would say when you're looking, be careful when you're looking at a probability model like this versus a poll and also understanding uh, that there might be errors in those as well. I would direct your attention for polling issues to 538.com or the Upshot on New York Times. They talk about them somewhat uh, eloquently as opposed to kind of your generic CNN or, or other types of things. And understand what polls mean. It doesn't mean it's a sure thing. Um, it means that there is some variability. There are some errors that can happen. All right, a couple of quick lessons from 2018 that help uh, talk about these issues in more concrete terms. The first is that people think differently based on what party they align with. If you look at this, in 2016, if you felt that the top issues in 2016, uh, if you were a Democrat, you felt that the top issues were foreign policy and the economy. If you're a Republican, you thought immigration and terrorism were the top issues, right? I want you then to look at 2018. The economy flips entirely. Now, between 2016 and 2018, there was not a lot of change in the economy. Um, all of the indicators tend to, tended to run the same way, tended to look about the same. Unemployment may have gone down a tad bit. Uh, between 2016 and 2018, but not enough that people actually noticed it. The bigger changes actually happened before that, which means that depending on how you view the uh, partisanship, how, depending on what party you align with, you may think of the economy as more of an important issue, um, depending on what year it is and who is in the presidency. Um, so you can look at this in a little more depth here based on excellent, good, not good, poor. It's a scale. Um, compare 2016 and then how it flips almost identically in 2018 based on partisanship alone. All right. So Federalist 14 here. Uh, the other two readings are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to let them stand on their own. But Federalist 14 and its inclusion here I know can be a little bit confusing, so I wanted to talk about that. The main topic of Federalist 14 is this idea of what is the difference between a republic and a democracy and, and what is it that is the Constitution is trying to do here. So in Federalist 14, what is being argued is that you really need a republic um, to mediate people's passions 
um, and and make good policy, good political choices, right? So in Federalist 10, Madison talked all about factions and all the problems they can bring. And in Federalist 14, they're saying, you need a republic to deal with those. And you need a republic because democracy can be really, really, really messy, as we know, right? Q. Geltzer's uh, article here, for example. But democracy works only when we're talking about small populations. At least, that's what they're arguing in Federalist 14. When you have fewer people and a smaller area, you can actually make decisions um, for the whole, by the whole. So it only works at a certain level, Federalist 14 argues. Most things that we call democracies aren't actually democracies at all. Um, there's something else. Democracy, as you get larger, is unruly, it's undesirable, it's not, um, it's not at all predictable, it's not clean, and it can create a lot of chaos. And remember, at the time of the founding, they were especially concerned about chaos because they had to deal with a lot of rebellions under the Articles of Confederation, but also because they were worried about you know, an invasion from Britain or France or someone else. So if democracy is messy and it's going to lead to chaos, why would you want to select it as a governing principle? A republic, on the other hand, allows people to elect representatives who can then come together and make deliberation happen. And deliberation happens when you offer a potential solution, someone else offers a potential solution, you debate, and maybe you have some changes that are made along the way to incorporate both. So the Constitution, um, this, paper, this Federalist paper argues, does this better because a republic is the only thing that can connect all of these uh, territories into one larger nation. If we want to stick with democracy, right, we are going to end up with perpetual rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, and that's going to destabilize us to the point where we're no longer safe as a nation. So it's important, uh, this Federalist paper argues, that we seek something that is not pure democracy, but rather a republic. All right, that is all for this week. Um, I know it's a fairly short lecture, and I'm trying to keep it that way. Um, but I want you to think about these ideas of republic versus democracy in a little more depth as we do the web activity. All right, so your web activity this week is fairly simple. I have given you three quotes here, one from Winston Churchill, one from John Adams, or uh, as close as I can find from John Adams. There are a couple attributions rolling around. And one from Woodrow Wilson about democracy, about voting, about democracy, about participation, however you want to phrase it. I want you to pick one quote and defend it. Say why they are right. Um, you can defend it with the concepts of this lecture or other things we have talked about before, but try and ground it in class principles. Paragraph or so will do it. Not much more is needed. I will put it up under the assignments, but you'll have to refer back here to get the quotes. All right. That is all for this week. Talk to you soon.